Hello, and welcome to The Word Podcast and another episode of The Word with Wisdom's Daughter. Today's video will be dedicated to the Women of the Bible series, episode two, Hagar, the Egyptian slave who called God by name. You are the God who sees me. Hagar is most known as the mother of Ishmaelites and the Hagarenes. Now, before we get into the scripture, I'll give you a quick summary on her story. Now, while Hagar is not the most well-known woman of the Bible, her story comes with a level of complexity and drama that you might not expect. And so Hagar was the Egyptian slave of Sarai, wife of Abram, also or better known as Abraham or Abraham. Unable to conceive a child with her husband, Sarai gave her slave Hagar to forcibly give her body to Abram to have a child. When Hagar became pregnant, Sarai became very jealous and treated her poorly. Hagar flees to the desert where she meets an angel of the Lord who asks her where she came from and where she's going. The angel ultimately tells Hagar to return to Sarai and submit to her, followed by a promise that her descendants would be too many to number and that she would have a son named Ishmael. Hagar then spoke to God and gave him the name Elroy the God who sees me. She had seen and was seen by God. Now the drama continues to unfold. As Hagar returns, she gives birth to Ishmael and some time had passed. Sarah again wishes for Hagar to be gone so badly so that Abraham sends Hagar and Ishmael with food and water into the wilderness. She and her son wandered on the desert of Beersheba. They ran out of water and Ishmael was very thirsty and began to weep. Hagar puts him under a bush and begins to sob, realizing that she's not going to be able to provide for the child and that he probably won't survive. So an angel of the Lord speaks to her, offering comfort and promising that God has heard her cries and that one day would make her son Ishmael into a great nation. God opens Hagar's eyes. She sees a well of water and gives her son a drink and therefore is saved. And so, as I said, this story is uh, complex on so many levels. Some of the running themes in this story uh, is infertility, uh, jealousy and envy, um, contempt and judgment. I would go as far as to say... um, You could potentially say trafficking and where there's an article that I'll share with you a little bit later about the idea of trafficking that comes out of this because Hagar is forced to do this. Okay. She's forced to give her body to her mistress's husband. And so she is ultimately battered, beaten and rejected by both Sarai and Abraham. But she's not abandoned because as she said, God sees her. Now, given her story, it's no surprise that especially women of color may find a kindred spirit in the person of Hagar. She's a young slave from Egypt who finds herself in the midst of a foreign and nomadic people. She's forced to give her body to her master, Abram, an idea that is first proposed by his wife, Sarai. Very interesting that she would give her husband permission to lay down with another woman, but as it would have it, that was the culture of the time. And so Sarai very much wants to conceive a child. She's experiencing issues with infertility. And so rather than wait on God, ultimately she decides to accept a cultural tradition of a surrogate. You could call it a modern day surrogate. And so Hagar becomes a surrogate for Sarai. And the tradition was, or the culture was, that when she was ready to give birth, she would actually give birth sitting on the lap of her surrogate. Or I'm sorry, she would, she would, yeah, the surrogate would sit on the lap of uh, the person that they were 
having the child for. And so ultimately, Hagar would sit on the lap of Sarai while she was giving birth. And the child, when the baby was conceived, would fall through the uh, surrogate's legs and the legs of the um, infertile woman. And so that tradition of the baby passing through the legs would ultimately uh, be a sign of the child being that woman's. And so it basically was just another form of surrogacy, but it was a forced surrogacy. And so eventually, or let me just roll back. And so Hagar obeys her mistress and her master, but ultimately she's rejected and scorned because as we said earlier, Sarah becomes very jealous. And we're going to go into the word and get all the details. I'm just giving you a high level overview. And so Sarah's mistreatment of Hagar while she's pregnant forces her to run away. Sarah is very harsh and very um, mean spirited towards Hagar. So Hagar flees to the desert where she meets the angel of God. And ultimately, again, he tells her to return to Sarai and give birth to Abram's son, Ishmael, who would become the father of a nation. And so Hagar is amazed that the living God, who was not her God, this was the God of her master, but that the living God saw her and she was filled with hope and returns to give birth to her son. Now, in God's time and by God's grace, this promised uh, son uh, or the promised son, rather, Isaac, is born to Sarah and Abraham. So ultimately what ends up happening is that Abraham and uh, Sarah, because at this point their, their names are changed uh, by God, that uh, they're able to conceive a son. This is the, the son that God had promised uh, Abram. He told him in his old age that he would conceive a son. And neither one really believed to the point where Sarah actually laughed. Okay. She actually laughed or she chuckled about it. And that is where that scripture comes from is anything too hard for God, right? Because the angel that was with them at that time questioned her and said, why did you laugh? And she says, I didn't laugh. And the angel says, oh, but you did laugh. And, you know, says there's nothing too hard for God. And so by this time they are blessed. They give, uh, they give birth to the legitimate son, and the promised son, Isaac. Now, after Isaac's birth, Sarah saw Hagar's child as a threat to Isaac's position as heir. And so basically she told Abraham, get rid of them. And so Hagar and Ishmael are sent into the desert with very little food, very little water. I mean, it, 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 was, it wasn't even enough for them to last a day. It was very meager portions. And so when the water ran out, Hagar sits apart from her son because he's dying. He's, he's dehydrated and he's, he's dying and she doesn't want to see that. And so Hagar um, sits there out of view of her son. And once again, the angel of the Lord appears to her to reassure her of God's plan and to remind her of his plan. And he reveals to her at that time a well of drinking water. And so she's refreshed. She's renewed, redirected. Hagar uh, basically raises her son alone. She becomes a single mom. And so that's another theme in this particular story. Uh, in addition to the infertility and the other things that I mentioned is um, single motherhood. And Isaac ultimately grows up to be strong and, and, and a powerful man and the founder of the Arab nations. And so disadvantaged and dispossessed women today can probably really relate to Hagar, especially experiencing uh, estrangement, prejudice, hardship, homelessness, grief, and despair, because these are all the things ultimately that Hagar experienced. And so let's go ahead and transition right into the word and there's quite a few scriptures that I need to read because as you can see on the screen, this uh, story actually technically begins in uh, chapter 12. And I don't know if I'm going to read uh, all of that, but um, I will read uh, some of it so that you can get some background on this story. All right. So here's the call of Abram. His name was Abram or Abram before his name was changed. The Lord said to Abram, go from your land, your relatives and your father's house. And again, I'm in Chapter 12, starting at verse 1.
The Lord said to Abram, go from your land, your relatives and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt and all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. Now, we'll delve into this a little bit more, but one of the things that is really significant about uh, this particular portion of scripture is that Abram did not know God up until this time. They, they served other gods. And Abraham was told to leave his father's house, leave his relative, leave his, his land, leave everything that he knew, walk away and go to a place that I'm going to show you. There was no GPS back then. There were no maps. He literally just had to start walking and God was going to guide him on the way. But remember, Abram did not know God at this point. And so he blindly followed the word of God, which is absolutely amazing. All right. And so, as I said, there were uh, issues of fertility uh, with Sarah. And so starting in chapter 16 now, verse 1. Abram's wife, Sarai, had not borne any children for him, but she owned an Egyptian slave named Hagar. Sarai said to Abram, since the Lord has prevented me from bearing children, go to my slave. Perhaps through her, I can build a family. And Abram agreed to what Sarai said. Of course he did. He's a man. What man? <laughs> okay. These were issues even back then. What man is going to say no to his wife if his wife tells him, you know, go lay down with this woman and have a child? All right. Um, so Abraham agreed to what Sarah said. So Abram's wife said, I took Hagar, her Egyptian slave, and notice it said took her, okay, which implies force. Took her, took Hagar, her Egyptian slave, and gave her to her husband, Abram, as a wife for him. Now, in biblical days, whoever you laid down with was your wife. Whoever, as a woman you laid with, was your husband. And so that's why it says as a wife for him, okay? Ultimately, Sarai was the main, okay? The the, the main woman, the, the number one wife. And Hagar was going to serve as a sister wife, okay? Or a mistress, if you want to call it that. This happened after Abram had lived in the land of Canaan for 10 years. He slept with Hagar and she became pregnant. When she saw that she was pregnant, her mistress became contemptible to her. Jealous, very, very jealous. Now, Hagar is often portrayed as a victim, but I have to lay some responsibility on Hagar because she did kind of turn her nose up at Sarai because Sarai couldn't bear children. And that was kind of the worst thing back then. It, and it's not necessarily the worst thing now because we have so many other methods to deal with infertility, but back then... It was really frowned upon uh, when a woman could not conceive. And so Hagar is looking down her nose at, uh, at Sarai. And when she saw that she was pregnant, her mistress became contemptible to her. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for my suffering. I put my slave in your arms. And when she saw that she was pregnant, I became contemptible to her. May the Lord judge me and you. Abram said to Sarai, here, your slave is in your power. Do whatever you want with her. Then Sarai mistreated her so much that she ran away from her. And not just anywhere. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring in the wilderness. So when we talk about wilderness, and I, I should have brought up some pictures, uh, my pictures from Israel, but uh, maybe I'll put those on a community post. But when we talk about the wilderness, think about pictures that you've seen of like the Sahara Desert or pictures that you've seen uh, where you see nothing but dry, rocky land. And that's all you see. That was the wilderness. There were no trees, no shrubs, just rocks. And so the angel of the Lord found her by a spring in the wilderness. The spring on the way to shore. He said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She replied, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, and let me just stop there. So when they said mistress, it's not modern day mistress, which is uh, a woman of a, of a married man who's basically being 
treated like a wife without the benefit of being a wife. Mistress meaning uh, the female version of master. So she says, I'm running away from my mistress, said I. The angel of the Lord said to her, go back to your mistress and submit to her authority. The angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your offspring and they will become too many to count. And so this is the beginning of the blessing for Hagar. Now, some of you may be wondering, why would God tell her to go back to the mistress who basically beat her and was mistreating her to the point that she's pregnant and would run away into the wilderness where she's sure to uh, perish? But look at the whole sentence. Go back to your mistress and submit to her authority. Remember I said Hagar was turning her nose up at Sarah or said I. And so he says, I will multiply your offspring and they will be too many to count. The angel of the Lord said to her, you have conceived and will have a son. You will name him Ishmael for the Lord has heard your cry and your cry of affliction. This man will be like a wild donkey. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand will be against him. He will settle near all his relatives. So she named the Lord and spoke to her. You are El Roy or El Roy. For she said in this place, have I actually seen the one who sees me? This is why the well is called Bir Laharoy. It is between Kadesh and Bered. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, El Roy. You, God, see me. For she said, have I remained alive here after seeing him? Therefore, the well was called Bir Laharoi, the well of the living one who sees me. Behold, it is between Kadesh and Bered. And so... This is just a depiction of um, potentially what Hagar might have looked like and the well. And it says, you are the God who sees me. I have seen the one who sees me. And so Hagar gave birth to Abram's son and Abram named his son Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar or Ishmael to him. And now we're going to skip over to chapter 21. There are a lot of things that do occur between 16 and 21, a whole lot of drama, but that will be for another Bible study. What is interesting here is that Hagar can really be considered the first person in the Bible at this point who actually names God. Okay. And again, she was an Egyptian slave. This was not her, um, this was not her culture or her religion. All right. So starting in chapter 21, verse one, the Lord came to Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised because God is a promise keeper. Sometimes we just have to be patient and things became very messy because Sarah was impatient. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the appointed time God had told him. Abraham named his son who was born to him, the one Sarah bore to him, Isaac. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. God did exactly what he said when he said he was going to do it. Sarah said, God has made me laugh and everyone who hears will laugh with me. She also said, who would have told Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne a son for him in his old age. The child grew and was weaned and Abraham held a great feast on the day Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son mocking the one Hagar, the Egyptian, had born to Abraham. And so Ishmael was making fun of Isaac and Sarah didn't like that. So she said to Abraham, drive out the slave with her son, for the son of the slave will not be a co-heir with my son, Isaac. This was very distressing to Abraham because of his son. But God said to Abraham, do not be distressed about the boy and about your slave. Whatever Sarah tells to you, listen to her because your offspring will be 
traced through Isaac. And I will also make a nation of the slave son because he is your offering. Remember the promise that he said to Abraham that he will make his uh, offspring as numerous as the stars. Early in the morning, Abram got up, took bread and a water skin and put them on Hagar's shoulders and sent her and the boy away. She left and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she left the boy under one of the bushes and went and sat at a distance about a bow shot away. For she said, I can't bear to watch the boy die. While she sat at a distance, she wept loudly. God heard the boy crying and the angel of the Lord called to Hagar from the heaven and said to her, what's wrong, Hagar? Don't be afraid for God has heard the boy crying from the place where he is. Get up, help the boy up and grasp his hand for I will make him a great nation. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well. So she went and filled the water skin and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy and he grew. He settled in the wilderness and became an archer. He settled in the wilderness of Paran and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. And so as you can see with the story as it's unfolded, there are so many twists and turns. Maybe you felt like Hagar. Maybe you have felt trapped, desperate for a break. You know, maybe you've been in a position where you were not the one calling the shots. You were in a situation where you had no say, wondering if God sees you. Well, the answer is he does. Hagar was a servant. And because Sarai, which is her name at the time, was in charge, Hagar one day found herself involuntarily married to Sarai's husband, Abram, and pregnant with his child. Now, I don't suppose Hagar had elaborate dreams for her life as a servant, but surely an unwanted marriage wasn't her first choice. In fact, the Bible tells us that when she learns she was pregnant, she looked on Sarai with contempt. Sarai wasn't particularly fond of Hagar either. These two women did not like each other. But even in the Bible, lives can have twists and turns and relationships can be very deeply flawed. Now, 14 years later, Sarai, who's now called Sarah, finally bears the child that God promised her in chapter 18. And by the time baby Isaac was weaned, Sarah was basically ready to get rid of Hagar once and for all. Her son is mocking hers and his um, presence ultimately was a threat to her son's inheritance in her mind. And just like that, Hagar and her son Ishmael were cast into the wilderness. They were rejected. They were cast out. And so Abraham, the first time Sarah is upset, says, that's your servant. Do what you want. But now that she has his child and he loves the child and is concerned about uh, the promise that God said to him um, and what that what kind of impact that might have on his own life. He's very saddened, but ultimately he follows his wife's orders. And so basically things go uh, from bad to worse. Okay. Things were good. Then they went to bad. Then so bad that Hagar walked the distance of about a bow shot from her dehydrated and starving son because she could not bear to watch him perish. Have you ever been there? Completely out of options. Not even sure where you went wrong in the first place. And in desperate, dire need of the Lord, but unsure if he even sees you. Well, let me tell you, God sees you and he knows exactly where you are. And he hears you. He hears your cry. You know, perhaps it's hard to look on Hagar's wilderness wanderings with anything but pity. It may be difficult to understand because for some of us, our consequences have never been quite that dire. I don't know if anyone listening has ever been in a position where they potentially had to watch their child leave this world. 
But the truth is, no matter our circumstances, Hagar's desperation for the Lord is exactly where each one of us ought to find ourselves every day. Not because we're, or just because we're in a desperate, dire situation, but because we are desperate for God, desperate for more of him. We ought to cry out, Lord, I lift up my voice in desperate need of your mercy right now, this day. My only option is you. My life is a wilderness without you. It's dry. It's cracked. It's brittle. It's hot. It's extreme heat in the day and extreme cold at night. Hagar's situation, she had hit rock bottom. It was awful. And she had nowhere to go. Nowhere to go but up. But do you see? Do you see what happened when she cried out? God was right there. He said, I will be with you. I am with you. And that is the same thing our Lord Jesus Christ said to his disciples in uh, his final hours, his last teaching uh, with them after the last supper or at the last supper. He says, lo, I will be with you until the ends of the earth. I am with you. And if God is with you, you are never truly alone, although you may feel lonely. This is the God of the Bible. He never takes his eyes off his people. He never stops seeing them and he will never stop seeing you. Whether you've been excuse me, whether you've been unjustly knocked down or drugged out into the wilderness or forced into the wilderness like Hagar, or you're waking up in a warm bed, it doesn't matter. As long as you wake up with a thirst, knowing that it's a thirst that only he can satisfy. Wherever we are, God sees us. He hears our plea, and he will meet our needs. So don't be afraid to cry out to him today because he's always listening. Always, always listening. Regardless of your circumstances, your social status, or how many times you've been knocked down, battered or beaten by life, you cannot escape God's care or his love. God provided for Hagar and her son, and he can and he will provide for you. Trust him because God can be trusted. His word will never return to him void, and God will always do what he says he will do. Reflect on a time As you go through the week, reflect on a time where you felt beaten down, rejected, unwanted. How did God refresh, renew, and redirect you? How did he redirect your path? And then consider sharing that testimony with a woman or someone you know who's experiencing rejection. Because the word says that We are saved by the word of our testimony, meaning that your testimony may be enough to help someone else and that it's possible that you went through what you went through so that you can help someone else who isn't as strong as you. Thank you so, so very much for uh, listening to this lesson. I hope that it was helpful for you and to you. I hope you learned something. I will put the scripture references in the description of this video. And if you have enjoyed the video, go ahead and hit that like button for me. Hit the subscribe button. Turn on your notifications so that you can be the first to know when I upload another video or go live. God bless you and keep you. In Jesus' name, 
Amen.